by 2050, it is predicted that 65% of the developing world's population will be urbanized. And a staggering 85% of the developed world will be living in cities. City planners, as recently as 50 years ago, were not even remotely aware that we were heading towards this level of density, let alone the city planners of the 16th and 17th century. Our planet and our civilizations are changing faster than ever before. Join me as I travel the globe talking to startup founders using technologies to make our world more interesting, accessible and livable. These are the entrepreneurs that are creating the future we will live in. This is Now Go Build. As recently as 1800, only 11% of Europe's population lived in cities. And keep in mind that those are just percentages. When you take into account an ever-rising population, the cities of the world are going to be bursting at their seams. They will struggle to keep up with transportation systems, social services, garbage collection, health and emergency services, air quality and homelessness. We can hardly destroy our old cities to make way for the cities of the future, but we can turn them into efficient hubs of human-centric innovation. Porto, in the north of Portugal, is a beautiful city with its origins dating back to 300 BC. It has long been a center for economic and social evolution. From the original port capes, trading hands between the Roman Empire and the Moors, it evolved into a world port and into a major technology hub. It is also the second most densely populated city in Europe. Necessity is the mother of invention, and Porto has become an epicenter of technological research into the smart city. One of the startups pushing this forward, Venium, has created a mesh network for the city of Porto. This network is the basis for incredible future possibility. Hey, Joao, how are you doing? Hello, how are Good you? to see you. Good to see Pleasure. you. Thanks for taking the time. These mesh networks give us new connectivity throughout cities. Tell me a bit about how the future of that looks, looks, looks like for, let's say, a city like Porto. Well, actually, we're in a perfect location. So I, I grew up on top of that hill. Um, and when I was growing up, actually, this bridge it used to be cars. Um, and I see this very much as a metaphor for the new Porto, because you see the brand new metro on this 120-year-old bridge. And what you're going to see in the future is that we're having more and more shared mobility, like the metro, but then also uh, vehicles, and in the future, autonomous vehicles, uh, basically providing uh, not just transportation services, but actually becoming part of the city infrastructure. At the same time, gathering data about the city that is fed into the cloud, uh, where we can use AI algorithms to actually figure out, you know, how can we lower the emissions of the city? How can we lower the noise? How can we make it easier for people to move around as part of a smarter city infrastructure? What is it that you guys really have built? So we look at vehicles not just as machines that carry people from one point to the other, but actually as part of the infrastructure. So these vehicles are internet access points. We have uh, looked at them also as mobile sensors. So Werner, we're gonna drive around Porto. Okay. And uh, this dashboard is gonna show us how the vehicle is connecting to the rest of the mesh network of buses and trucks that are uh, driving around. Okay, so tell me what I'm seeing here. So we are in downtown Porto, surrounded by lots of different vehicles. Um, and this car, where we are right now, is connecting to other vehicles and to the Wi-Fi network and the access point, uh, also using DSRC, which is the technology for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. In this dashboard, we actually see uh, what we can't see, namely all the wireless connections. Uh, and all of this happens seamlessly. So the applications and the services don't really care whether I'm using one network or the other. And also the human users just care about the quality of experience that they're getting. I can understand this connecting to the, to the hotspot, but if you see connections, the blue connections between the buses, or between our car and those two buses, what is being exchanged between the, those two? The vehicles are acting as relays for another. That means that an access point that only has maybe, you know, 200 meters of range, with the vehicle now has 400 meters, 500. So that okay. reduces the need of the infrastructure. 
There's a big part of the communication which is actually machine-to-machine -machine communication that happens automatically okay. uh, so that uh, the transportation system can make decisions, but also that the city itself uh, is able to have very rich maps and data sets on which to base, you know, routes for garbage collection or mobility patterns of, of people, understanding ultimately how we can be more efficient and more sustainable also from an environmental point of view. I took a ride to Matushinos, the home of Porto's actual port, to visit Zeia, a company developing autonomous vehicles, micro-mobility solutions like the scooter, and AIR, a carbon credit system that has been adopted by the municipality. When Maria showed me the big hangar out there, on almost every product it says AIR. So tell me about what that is. You know, regarding mobility, we always make some kind of choices. Either, either I use public transportation or my bicycle or my car or walking, whatever. It has an impact on environment. So air is a platform that counts the CO2 that you didn't produce by making sustainable choices. You go to the app and you see the counting of the CO2 that you're saving in real time. This is very important for people to get the impact. It's not just about explaining it, it's for them to experience the impact itself. So what our platform does is it quantifies those savings. Okay. And then we tokenize those savings. We create a token for every 100 grams of CO2 that doesn't get emitted and enables you to exchange them for you know, uh, more mobility products, uh, green products, whatever it, it needs to locally enhance more sustainable choices. So how do you do the measurements? I can understand if you drive the electronic car, yeah, you have no CO2 emissions, I assume. So where do you compare it? Our algorithm takes into account several variables. One of the things, although you drive an electric car, you don't have emissions, but you, you put some electricity on the battery Fair. and that has emissions. So we monitor those chargings. Every 15 minutes, we know exactly what the energy makes any, anywhere in the world. So that basically means that the data that you're collecting with air actually gives you great insight, for example, in the efficiencies or the inefficiencies of particular routes for the city. Yes, that's the kind of data that we share with the municipality. So on, on top of that, we put more layers like public transportation, local business, uh, and then you have mobility operators. Maybe the most efficient way for you guys to, you know, put the the scooters or the electrical cars, whatever. It's if you use it this, this, and this spot, because then we'll have interface with local commerce, this kind of stuff. So we we help them figure this out also. Mm -hmm. It's been it's been a it's been a journey because in the end of the day, we are talking transformation of the cities. This technology means nothing if not integrated into cities as policy. I met with two different government officials who were doing just that. How does a, a technology platform like Air help you? Air is uh, for us a revolution on public policies because we can uh, give to the people a tool where they can measure their own options on clean mobility. So you put policies in place to ensure that any mobility operator that comes into the city actually makes use of a platform like Air to give you the measurements, but also to give themselves the measurements to, to optimize their productivity. It's true, and we are telling them that uh, we will trade the municipality taxes for operating to air credits. So they can give the municipality taxes to their own users as in the form of kilometers of operation, minutes of operation. We are linking mobility needs to our local economy. And we are uh, just trying now to get the, the, the next step and link this micro-mobility, electrical, clean systems to the public transportation. When we do this, we can give people complete alternative to private transportation, which is our main goal. I've heard that Porto is the second densest populated city in Europe. What kind of challenges does that give for sort of urbanization and development of the city? Well, a lot, because when you have a dense city, you have uh, these infrastructures that you have to put in, in, in place. In the same time, it's very good to have a dense city because you can really take advantage of the infrastructures in order to serve more people. Yeah, policies probably play an important role also in driving sort of how, how a city like this changes, especially such an old city like Porto. 
must have very unique problems yep. that, let's say, a new city would never have. Well, for sure, you, you know, you have narrow streets, you have uh, the parking spaces is not so, uh, so big, so you need to improve the public transport, you need to move people around. You will have a new metro line coming to the centers, but we need uh, uh, to do it in a way that uh, you continue to have people living here, you continue to have people at shopping here, restaurants, so this has to be a balance, you know, managing a city is all about balance. Who is using it? So the primary use for us today, on the one hand, uh, is uh, to enable new digital experiences for people. Uh, we have found that, for example, public transit becomes more attractive when you offer free internet. And so it makes public transportation more attractive and, and that makes our cities more sustainable. The mesh is just a network. Correct. Yeah, on top of that, you can build all sorts of different applications. Yeah. Is there a role for this, let's say, in improving public utilities as well? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we had a project here with uh, the uh, garbage collection trucks, uh, where basically you have uh, garbage containers that have sensors and know if they're full or not, and they are wirelessly enabled. So when the truck comes by, it asks the garbage collection uh, site, uh, are you full? It's yes or no, it's actually binary, zero or one. <laughs> and then if not, they just continue their routes. And this again improves efficiency, lowers fuel consumption for garbage collection. Then you start having a wealth of knowledge and context that allows you to make better decisions for, for citizens. Why is this important for autonomous vehicles? So autonomous vehicles, if they are connected, they can provide a safer service with less energy consumption and less computation. Let me give you an example. If the vehicle in front of me is communicating directly with me and telling me, uh, hey, I'm gonna turn left uh, at 30 miles per hour, uh, then I don't need to run fancy AI algorithms on all my sensors to be able to figure that out because the vehicle is telling me. And so this is an example of how I can trade off communication and computation uh, and be able even to do microtransactions, say using blockchain, uh, to be able to decide who gets the right of way, who goes first, who goes in front, and how we make the best use of the infrastructure. Ultimately, I think we can have a mobility system with much less vehicles, much better experience for people, and, and, and leaving all this uh, space that today is taken by parking and by traffic congestion uh, to have you know, more trees uh, and fight climate change, which is one of the big purposes of our company as well. So if you look, let's say, five years ahead, how do you see Porto? What, what I see is definitely the technology is improving very fast. They will improve a lot to the amount of data that you can transfer, and this will allow definitely to have autonomous vehicles. Uh, with autonomous vehicles, you will lose the vehicles in the streets and you will gain space for the citizens. Yeah. That will be a major change in cities when you give back what the cars have taken. Can humans take back what has been given to cars? Can we create systems that return our cities to places that allow for movement and life that has a quality beyond merely surviving? Technologists like those at Venium and Sia are looking at this problem with a view that is as revolutionary as the car was at the turn of the 20th century. Let's hope that the results can shift the way we live as seismically as the automobile did. And in a way, that puts our humanity at the forefront.
Amsterdam. I love this city. My city. I'm in Amsterdam for one of my favorite gatherings, the Amsterdam Dance Event. It is exciting to see the role that technology is playing in removing the obstacles between the song in the musician's head and the wall of sound that helps us do one thing. Dance. 